Ken Landa, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Depakote, also known as Divalproex Sodium. It comes in two forms, a delayed release and an extended release. The delayed release was first approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1983. It has an enteric coating that delays the absorption until after it gets out of the stomach. And then the extended release form, approved in the year 2000, has the same active ingredient but it's mixed a little bit differently with a special kind of a matrix and an outer coating so it's stable over a longer period of time and the body and the absorption is somewhat more delayed. Well, the medicine is used about five million times a year in the United States and the active form of both of those medicines is the same. It's valproic acid or valproate. The indications are only three in number, although it's widely used for a variety of unapproved or off-label indications. But the approved indications are, number one, for the treatment of mania associated with a bipolar disorder. It's the acute mania. It's not so much for prevention of mania. It's also used in people who have epileptic attacks or who have seizures. It could be used either as monotherapy or as combined therapy, and it's used in people who have migraine headaches as prophylaxis against the headaches, not for acute treatment of the headache, but to prevent the headaches. Now, in the community, it's very frequently used for a variety of off-label uses by psychiatrists and by internists and by general practitioners. It's used for schizophrenia and people who don't seem to respond to the atypical antipsychotics, drugs like Cyprexa or Abilify. It's used in schizophrenia as a mood stabilizer. It's used in people who have Parkinson's disease, who are on treatment for Parkinson's disease, but one of the complications is what we call the dopamine dysregulation syndrome, where people have certain cravings and they have impulse control disorders and they gamble and hypersexuality. What's used in people who have impulsivity with the borderline personality disorder or brain injury or dementia. It's used in people who have aggression or agitation. It's used to treat alcohol dependence, and some people use it even for neuropathic pain. But let's talk about mania. So mania is a condition where people have a decreased need for sleep, they have a pressure in their speech, they have motor hyperactivity, they have grandiose thoughts and ideas, they're aggressive, they have poor judgment, they have a flight of ideas, they pass from one thought to another. Well, in people who are so severely affected by the mania that they need hospitalization, they're given Depakote. They're given Depakote so that by day 7 they're receiving about 1,100 milligrams a day. By day 14 they're receiving about 1,500 milligrams a day. Day 21 they're all the way up to 2,400 milligrams a day. And we rate them according to the Young Mania Rating Schedule. That's sort of standard in mania. To, to rate how the patients are. Well, if we look at how the patients do, when they start off at a score of about 30, they fall with therapy by about 10 points compared to placebo where there isn't any change. So what does that mean? It means that it seems like it does something, but you have to realize that a person is diagnosed as having hypomania when they have a score of over 20, and when they have a score of over about 23, 25 or so, that's when we consider them to have mania. So we haven't really cured the condition. Another study compared taking either placebo or lithium to the Depakote. They found that lithium seemed to be a little better than the Depakote, and both of them were much better than placebo. Another study looked at people who were somewhat more severely affected. They had uh, an initial score of somewhere between 38 and 40. If we look at what happened on placebo, the score decreased by about 4 points. On lithium, it decreased by about 10.5 points. On the Depakote, decreased by about 9.5 points. So those are relatively close, so there's improvement with both the lithium and the Depakote, but still, if we start off at 38, 39, and we drop it by 10 points, we're still in the mania family. So we haven't cured the condition. That's why frequently people are taking multiple drugs. They have to take what we call add-on therapy or adjunctive therapy. Now, the Depakote seems to work much more rapidly than the lithium, so if we need rapid control, that's probably the drug of choice. On the other hand, it doesn't seem to be as effective as lithium 
either for treating the mania or even, even for preventing mania from recurring. And the lithium seems to be a better choice in people who have the depressive stage, of course, of the mania of, of the, the, the manic depressive disorder, rather, or the bipolar disorder, as it's now known. Well, let's talk about migraine headaches. So if we look at people who have migraine headaches, let's say they have, on average, about five and a half migraine headaches a month. On the Depakote, they'll have about three to four migraine headaches a month. So a little tiny decrease. So if you look at placebo in another study, they have about four and a half migraine headaches a month, but on Depakote, they have somewhere between three and three and a half migraine headaches a month. So there's some reduction, but again, it's not a home run. Over a four-week time period, we might reduce the average number of migraine headaches comparing the placebo to the Depakote by about one headache. Now, for some people, it might be fantastic, but on average, it's okay. And if we talk about epilepsy, well, a lot of people with epilepsy are going to start the drug and then drop out because of some discomfort with the medication. But if we look at a low dose, comparing people on baseline who, let's say, have about 14 seizures every two months, well, at a low dose, it can be reduced to 13 to 14, so not all that much difference, but on a high dose, we go from a baseline of about 13 epileptic seizures every eight weeks down to on therapy about 11. So we get some benefit. Now if we talk about an add-on therapy, let's say instead of giving the Depakote by itself, but let's say let's add the Depakote to either Tegretol or Dilantin, well then we see a significant fall. So we could go from 16 migraine, I mean 16 uh, epileptic seizures every eight weeks down to about eight epileptic seizures every eight weeks. So again, we have significant benefit, but we really haven't cured the whole problem. And if we look overall at people who have the complex partial seizures, the likelihood of more than 50% reduction, unfortunately, is less than 50% of the patients. So in other words, more than half of the patients get less than 50% improvement. Well, that doesn't sound so great. Well, let's say you want to switch from the delayed release pills, you're taking several two or three times a day, to the extended release where you only have to take one a day. Well, you need to add about anywhere between 8% and 20% of the dose of the delayed release to come up with the dose of the extended release. Now, there's some problems with the medication. So it's not for women who are of the childbearing potential who are not taking appropriate methods of contraception. If you have uh, liver disease, not a good drug for you. If you're hypersensitive to the drug, obviously not a good idea. So if we look at people who have migraine headaches and who take the pill at low dose, about a third of them are going to suffer from nausea and somewhere between 10 and 20 percent are going to suffer from tremors and diarrhea and dizziness and they're just going to feel blah. Well, there's another problem. And more than half of the patients are going to gain at least 8% of the body weight. And about 40% are going to gain more than 10% of the body weight. So it's not uncommon for these people to go on binge cycles and have weight gain of somewhere between 10 and 30 pounds. And a significant number of them are going to start losing their hair. Now for epilepsy, same sort of side effects, but in addition there's vomiting and shortness of breath and abdominal pain and some blurred vision and some difficult control over the eye movements. And not uncommonly we find amenorrhea or infertility in men. We find back pain and constipation and sometimes depression, ringing in the ears, and easy bruisability, which means that you really need to have your platelets checked, blood test, relatively frequently, especially early on in therapy. And in elderly individuals, somnolence or tiredness seems to be common. It's a medicine that can irritate the stomach, so oftentimes you need to take it with food, and it can cause liver injury, especially during the first six months of therapy. So you need to have regular blood tests during that period of time. And certainly if you have pre-existing liver disease, maybe this isn't the drug for you. Symptoms that 
suggest that maybe the liver is being affected. You could have some malaise or some weakness or your tiredness or you can have a loss of appetite or vomiting or loss of control of the epileptic seizures. Well, another problem is pancreatitis. Pancreatitis, fortunately, is relatively rare. However, it can come on at any time, soon after you start the medicine or a long time after you've been on the medicine. And unfortunately, the pancreatitis can be so severe, it can lead to fatalities. Warning signs, certainly, if you take the medicine, develop severe abdominal pain or nausea or vomiting or loss of appetite, it's, it's suggestive you ought to talk to the doctor. And unfortunately, it can increase your thoughts of suicide or suicidal behaviors by about twofold at 12 weeks. And if it's combined with Topramax or Topamax, then it might decrease the body temperature quite severely down to less than 95 degrees or might increase the amount of ammonia in the body and affect your brain function. And there's a black box warning suggesting that you might have some life-threatening reactions with the medicine. Might start off innocently enough with some weakness or tiredness or malaise or some anorexia, loss of appetite or vomiting, and then go on to facial edema, but then progress to what's known as the DRESS syndrome. The DRESS syndrome stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms that can be associated with life-threatening liver inflammation, kidney inflammation, heart inflammation, lung inflammation, cause significant blood abnormalities, and add to all of that, it's not for women who are pregnant or considering pregnancy. If a woman is of the childbearing ear, years, as I mentioned, you should be on a birth control medication because if you are pregnant and take the medicine, chances are about 10% that the offspring is going to have at least significant major malformations. It's about four to five times greater than other anti-epileptic medicines. Congenital malformations occur, neural tube abnormalities. The significantly reduced IQ is going to occur in those children as they grow up. Neurodevelopmental disorders, spina bifida, autism, all of that, especially in the first trimester where we have structural abnormalities. They can occur at any time during pregnancy, but especially in the first trimester with craniofacial defects and cardiovascular defects and limb abnormalities and hypospadias develops. It's thought that, well, maybe if you use supplements of folic acid, that would be protective, but we don't really have any good evidence for it. It's often suggested, but as I say, the evidence is really lacking. If a woman is breastfeeding, it might be okay, but a better part of valor would be to consider the risk-benefit, consider whether maybe some other medicine might be more appropriate. And for the geriatric population, the dose has to be started relatively low and increased relatively slowly. Now, unfortunately, a lot of medicines can stimulate or inhibit some drug metabolizing enzymes and then alter the amount of valproate that happens to be in the system. So. If you're taking the Depakote and you also happen to take either Dilantin or Tegretol or Phenobarbital or Primadone or Lamictal, or if you're taking Rifampin, those medicines stimulate some of the metabolizing enzymes so they decrease the amount of Depakote in the system. Well, that's a significant issue because you might lose control of your epilepsy, you might lose control of the ability to prevent the migraine headaches or lose control of the mania. Well, on the other hand, we have other drugs that can increase the concentration of the Depakote in the system, the valproic acid, and then they might lead to toxicity, drugs that might be like felbamate or some of the antidepressants. And we also have to be careful if you combine even simple aspirin or relatives of penicillin or if you're taking a birth control pill well, birth control pill containing estrogen is going to increase the clearance of the valproate, decrease the amount in the system. And you'll also have to be careful if you are taking warfarin or tricyclic antidepressants or even certain drugs to treat AIDS or the HIV. Well, interestingly, at least in the laboratory studies, it seems that Depakote or valproic acid can actually increase the replication of the HIV virus and the cytomegalovirus. 
we don't know whether that has practical implications for patients who have those diseases, however. Now, if we look at the delayed release, and the names are confusing. Why they would call one a delayed release and the other an extended release, I don't know. It just seems to be confusing, but if you take the delayed release, well, it's going to be absorbed faster. You get a higher maximum concentration in the system, but you have greater fluctuation in the amount that's in the blood at any given time. It has a shorter half-life than the extended release, which means you have to take the delayed release two or three times a day as opposed to the extended release that you take only one time a day. The dose obviously depends on which particular pill you're taking. When you take it, you should swallow the pill whole, you don't crush it, you don't chew it. If we're talking about how you start the dose either for mania or for seizure disorder, it's kind of a peculiar and complicated run-up. You start relatively low and increase relatively quickly. But if you're talking about treatment of migraines or prevention of migraine headaches, then the dose is relatively straightforward. It's either 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams a day. Both of them seem to be okay. They're not great, but they're okay. If we add the medicine, if we add the Depakote to other anti-epileptics to gain control, chances are we don't have to adjust the dose, say, of Tegretol or Dilantin if we want to go from monotherapy with the Depakote DR to the ER, we have to add about 10 to 20 percent of the dose. The way the medicine works, we really don't know. It seems to work on the GABA amino benzoic acid, or GABA, seems to calm the central nervous system down. There seems to be a nonlinear association with how much you take and how it works. So the free fraction of the drug is the active drug. It's about 10 percent at a relatively low dose. It could be as high as 20 percent at a relatively high dose. And for some reason in seniors, the free portion could be up to around 30 to 40 percent. Now that's important because it seems that that unbound fraction is the fraction that gets into the central nervous system. Well, how is the drug metabolized? going to be metabolized in the liver for about 50 percent of the dose. It's going to be metabolized in the mitochondria in about 40 percent. And that means that especially children who have other forms of abnormalities that might affect the mitochondria, they may have more difficulty clearing the drug. If you have liver impairment or kidney impairment, obviously a smaller dose is needed. And unfortunately, at least in laboratory conditions, we find that in rats, this drug causes a type of a tumor known as uh, subcutaneous fibrosarcoma. In mice, it causes benign pulmonary adenomas, tumors in the lung. And in rats and in dogs, it causes testicular atrophy and a decrease in the production of sperm. But the good news about the drug is it's relatively inexpensive. So if you get the delayed release, you could get that for cash for 500 milligram tablets, about 60 of them, for only $22 cash. Unless you go to Walgreens where it's $186. If you have a coupon that you can get a good Rx, the price of the drug could fall to as low as $15, except at Walgreens where it's $65. If you wanted the brand name, it would cost about $400. Now, if you want the extended release, that's more expensive. So even at cash, the cash cost, would be somewhere between $160 and $200, but at Walgreens it's going to be about $400. If you get it with a coupon, at most stores it will be about $30. You get the coupons for nothing over at GoodRx on your computer. If you want the brand name, it's going to be about $430, but if you, well, $430 to $500. So anyway, that's the story of Depakote. Depakote can be a useful drug, but it certainly isn't a home run drug. It has two forms. The names are confusing. The delayed release, the extended release, the delayed release you have to take several times a day. Extended release you take one a day. Seems to be used widely for a lot of conditions for which it's not FDA approved and for which we don't really have all that great evidence that the medicine seems to work very well. 
but certainly it can help prevent migraine headaches, and it's certainly much less expensive than some of the newer drugs available. It can help with epileptic seizures, but again, oftentimes has to be taken with other kind of medications. And as far as mania is concerned, remember it's for acute mania. It's not for prevention of mania. Anyway, if you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe, tell a friend. And anyway, of course, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.